Bibi and Tina. Shadow over Martin's farm. Vacation at last. A crisp morning breeze blew in through the open bedroom window. Bibi Blocksburg, the little witch from Newtown, snuggled up deeper into her blanket and took a breath. <sighs> the air smelled like summer, with a hint of brightly colored flower meadows and freshly mowed grass. Bibi, she suddenly heard her friend Tina's familiar voice. Wake up! It's time to get up! Oh no, mumbled Bibi. She pulled the covers up over both ears and with a groggy, muffled voice replied, Five more minutes. Absolutely not, you sleepyhead, laughed Tina. We promised to help mom with breakfast. The camp kids will be up any minute. She shook Bibi, but Bibi buried herself even deeper under her pillow. All right then, if you're not gonna listen. Without hesitation, Tina grabbed her friend's blanket and tore it from the bed. Before Bibi knew what had happened, a pillow swung around and landed directly in her face. Just you wait, came Bibi's voice from underneath. I'll get you back. She snatched the pillow by a corner and flung it in Tina's direction, kicking off the world's greatest pillow fight. Laughing, the two girls chased each other all over the room, zigzagging and jumping across beds until finally, lying on the floor completely out of breath, they called a truce. Peace, Tina gasped. Well, maybe just this once, Bibi panted through a big smile. Suddenly, they heard Mrs. Martin calling out from the hallway below. Tina, Bibi, you were going to help me with breakfast. Startled, Tina took a look at her alarm clock. It was already after seven. Oh dear, time to hurry. The girls had only a moment for a quick freshen up in the bathroom. Back in Tina's room, they quickly slipped into their clothes, a t-shirt and riding pants. Tina took another look at the mess the two had made with their pillow fight. It's a good idea if mom doesn't see this, she murmured. With all the stress she's been under at the moment, I doubt she'll think it's funny. You're right. We'll clean it up quickly after breakfast, Bibi reassured her. And you know what we'll do then, cried Tina, and closed the door behind the chaos. We're free until lunchtime. We'll have a race. A short time later, the first children began shuffling into the cozy breakfast room of Martin's farm. They rubbed their eyes sleepily and yawned as they sat down at their tables. To greet their appetites were crispy bread rolls, fresh creamed butter, sweet jam made from the fruits at Martin's farm, and to drink, hot chocolate and tea. Mmm, raspberry, my favorite jam, cried Linus, a cheeky little rascal with a snub nose and a face full of freckles. Hey, I want some of that, demanded his little sister, Lena. Don't argue, there's plenty, laughed Tina. Good morning, everyone. The voices quickly hushed when Tina's brother, Roger, entered the room. Everyone happily returned his greeting as Roger turned to the older ones in the group. Well, who's going to take part in the show jumping today? Almost before Roger had finished his question, the girls in the group raised their arms in a flash and shouted, Me! Me! The 18-year-old blonde Roger was very popular with the girls, but the boys also liked him. He was a fantastic riding instructor, and there was no one among the other children who did not want to take part in Roger's jumping lessons. Bibi and Tina had come up with something very special for the younger ones. After lunch, they wanted to take them all on a two-day excursion. Since they wanted to camp nearby, Roger would be able to check in on them from time to time. The plan was that those who had never sat on a horse before could ride in the big wagon, which was pulled by the ponies Max and Moritz. The remaining children would ride the other ponies, and Bibi, Tina, and Alex would of course ride on their horses. Their destination would be the old mill where they would spend the night in tents on the bank of the mill pond. Tina was really looking forward to the trip. She and Bibi always had great fun looking after the children at camp. This time, however, the anticipation was immense because her friend Alexander von Falkenstein would be there. So the day's schedule for the children, big and small, was set. After everyone had finished eating, Bibi and Tina cleared the tables and dashed up to their room. On a mission, they quickly cleared away the chaos and raced back down the stairs with riding helmets in hand. Tina went with Bibi to the office to say goodbye to her mother before they set out. The door was slightly ajar and the two girls could hear Mrs. Martin talking on the phone. Her voice was louder than usual and sounded a bit strained. When she had hung up, Tina asked, Who was that, Mummy? You sounded kind of annoyed. 
Mrs. Martin hesitated to reply. Oh, I'm probably just overreacting a little bit, she began. That was the secretary of a building contractor. His name is Jake Overland, and he's not able to find a place for his daughter Fiona in the country club where she usually stays during the summer. Since he can't take care of her with all his important meetings, his secretary has been calling everywhere and finally came upon us. This Fiona usually goes to country clubs? asked Bibi. Those posh places where they only have purebred Arabians to ride and the girls sleep in single rooms? Well, something like that, said Mrs. Martin. And I don't want her to find everything inadequate here and start spreading a bad mood. But maybe I just worry too much. Anyway, I let myself be persuaded, and Fiona will arrive here this afternoon. That was the end of the Fiona Overland conversation for Mrs. Martin, and she turned back to office work on her desk. Bibi and Tina chirped goodbye with a see you later and then ran out into the yard. The sun was already high in the sky and the day was heating up, but inside the stable it was still pleasantly cool. Sabrina and Amadeus recognized the two girls by the sound of their voices and greeted them with a joyful neigh. It seemed an eternity since Bibi had seen Sabrina. She had been so late arriving at Martin's farm the night before that she didn't even get the chance to greet her favorite horse. Now Bibi cuddled and squeezed her while Sabrina gave Bibi a loving nudge with her velvety snout. The picture-perfect gray mare seemed to look forward to the ride as much as the chestnut Amadeus. Both snorted cozily when Bibi and Tina brushed and groomed them. After the two girls had saddled and bridled them, they put one foot in the stirrup and hopped up, gave a light thigh pressure, and the two horses began to move. As soon as they had left the farm gates behind them, the two friends pushed their horses into a trot. Whoever's first to the old oak, cried Tina to her friend. All right, Bibi called back. You want a jacket for the breeze? She laughed. Giddy up, Sabrina. Go, Amadeus, go, cheered Tina to her stallion. Both girls dashed off at a gallop across the meadows behind Martin's farm. A Little Pink Princess Alex jammed his sleeping bag tightly into one of his saddlebags. Finally, the clasp was closed. Had he now packed everything? He had packed his laundry bag and clothes for changing in the left saddlebag, under all the camping gear, and in the right bag were now the sleeping bag and his flashlight. And here were the straps for fastening the tent, and there were the- Oh man, the tent! Alex suddenly remembered. He'd almost forgotten the most important thing. But where was the tent? He had used it the last time he'd gone on a trail ride with his father through the Hungarian plains. But that was a while ago now. The tent was clearly not in his room. Tina liked to tease him about how ridiculously tidy it always was. Alex, on the other hand, found his sense of orderliness quite practical. And in this situation, for example, he could see at a glance that the tent wasn't lying around anywhere. It was possible his father had stowed it somewhere in the castle along with the other luggage from Hungary, though Alex didn't really feel like asking him at the moment where it could be. Count Falco von Falkenstein had been extremely tense and irritable the last few days. A reporter from Estate and Garden magazine was going to interview him for an article about Castle Falkenstein and the history of its inhabitants. The Count was well versed in his family's history, but there were a few gaps which he absolutely wanted to fill before the journalist arrived. From morning to night he buried himself in the library brooding over centuries-old documents and had given strict orders that he was only to be disturbed in the event of an extreme emergency. It's not an extreme emergency yet, Alex thought, but if I don't find the tent quickly, it will be one soon. Alex had promised to help Tina prepare for the trip. His girlfriend would be upset with him if he showed up late at Martin's farm, and Alex wanted to avoid that at all costs. I think it's an emergency now, he decided without further ado. In his room, there was a connecting door to the castle library. Alex took one deep breath, pushed the handle down, and opened the door. Good afternoon, father, he began. I don't mean to intrude, but I... But this is as far as he got. A window was open in the library as well as in Alex's room. And at once, a violent, unexpected gust of wind swept through both chambers, whisking some of the ancient documents off his father's desk and slamming the library window shut with a deafening bang. For a brief moment, both stunned and speechless, Falco von Falkenstein shot a look at the papers scattered all over the floor. Alexander, he roared. His face reddened with anger as he resounded, 
Not only am I willing to tolerate a disturbance in an extreme emergency, but now you barge in here and mess up days of precious work. S sorry father Alex stammered sheepishly, but it is an emergency. So what is it? demanded the Count, examining his son sharply through his monocle. Alex thought about Tina and gathered all his courage. I... Uh, I can't find my tent. The Count stared at Alex in such a bewildered way as if his son had told him that all the horses in the castle had grown wings and had flown away. Only then did he seem to understand what Alex had actually said, and with an unmistakable rumbling undertone inquired, Your tent? His head was no longer red, but a few different shades of purple. Because of your tent, you dare behave in such an improper manner? Guiltily, Alex lowered his head with the hope of softening the thunderstorm that was about to follow. Everything his father had said so far was only the prelude to an even more powerful rant. Alex was quite sure of that. But just as the Count inhaled a deep breath to commence, he was suddenly interrupted by a throat-clearing sound. <clears throat> if the Count will allow me... Alex looked up in disbelief. Wasn't that Butler Eckelbert? Indeed. He was standing at the other end of the library, gently maneuvering an ostrich-plumed feather duster across the books that the Count had not used. If the Earl will permit, continued the butler, I will take the young man's tent from the attic. There I stowed it away with the other camping equipment at your behest after your trip to Hungary. This took the wind out of the Count's sails. His anger fizzled away, especially at the sight of Alex hurriedly helping Ecclebert collect the scattered papers. S sorry again, Father, muttered Alex apologetically. Yes, yes, all right. Count Falco von Falkenstein adjusted his displaced monocle and raised an index finger as a warning. But let me emphasize once again, I will not tolerate disturbances to my work due to trivialties. And you, Ecclebert, should not be waving that thing around here either. No, sir, said the butler with a bow. Then why do you do it? Your guest arrives this afternoon, sir. You know, the historian who will assist you in your work. And since you both spend a lot of time in the library, I took the liberty. Oh my goodness, the Count interrupted him. Professor Albert Cuckoo, the expert on local gentility. I'd almost forgotten him. Is he coming today already? After your daily nap, the butler replied. Which, by the way, you interrupted yesterday for utterly trivial reasons, the Count began to rant again. Without my catnap, I am unable to cope with this colossal workload. Such a disturbance will not occur again, assured the butler. Um, father? Alex interrupted the conversation. May I go now? I really, really need the tent. I even plead for it, my son, cried the Count. And you too, Ecclebert. Go, go, and let me do my work in peace at last. Goodbye. When the butler had pulled the door into the lock behind him, Alex breathed a sigh of relief. If he hurried with his saddle and rode at a gallop to Martin's court, he might still make it in time. Butler Ecclebert seemed to notice how Alex was in a hurry. I will do my best, young sir, he promised, and bring the tent down to the stable as quickly as I can. Ecclebert was simply the best, Alex thought, and then the two of them hurried away. Alex down the grand staircase to the ground floor, the butler up the spiral staircase to the west tower to the top floor. Meanwhile, Bibi and Tina were at it again in another galloping race. Tina had won the first two races, but now Bibi was ahead by a few lengths. She caught a glimpse of Martin's farm up in front of her. This time I'm gonna win, thought the little witch and cheered Sabrina on. You can do it, my sweet. The gray mare snorted and charged into the final run. Bibi and Sabrina were already heading straight for the farm gate when she threw a quick glance back at her friend. They had left Tina and Amadeus far behind, and Bibi was beaming. She turned around just in time to see what was now blocking the entrance to Martin's farm. A car parked in the middle of the courtyard entrance. Stop, Bibi cried frantically. At the very last second, she managed to regain control of Sabrina. The mare protested with a loud neigh and reared, nearly throwing Bibi out of the saddle. Oh, easy, sweetheart, Bibi whispered to her. Sabrina stood still and whinnied excitedly. Bibi bent over and patted her neck reassuringly. 
Everything okay, you two? Tina had seen Bibi's emergency stop and managed to gently navigate her way from a trot to a step. She came to a halt right beside Bibi and Sabrina. Amadeus snorted loudly. Tina got off and led him by the reins. I think Sabrina has recovered from the shock, Bibi noted and swung herself out of the saddle. She too could feel how the sudden jolt had affected her limbs. What kind of idiot parks his car in the driveway, Tina rebuked. Only now did Bibi find time to take a closer look at what had been blocking the finish line. It was a big, shiny blue luxury car. The paint was gleaming, as if it had just come out of the car wash. Bibi and Tina spotted who had parked it once they squeezed their horses in behind the farm entrance. A man stood next to the driver's door. He was small and stocky and reminded the two girls of a bulldog. His fine black suit fit perfectly despite his shape, and beside him stood a girl who looked about eight years old and appeared to be his daughter. She was dressed in pink from top to bottom, a pink hairband, a pink silk scarf, a pink t-shirt, a pink skirt, and pink ballerinas. And everything was covered with glitter that sparkled and glistened in the sun. The man seemed to have noticed nothing at all of Bibi and Sabrina's emergency stop outside on the street. He did not even turn around to look at the two girls. He glanced impatiently at his wristwatch, then reached through the open window of his car and pressed the horn energetically. Too energetic for Sabrina and Amadeus. The horses bucked to the side and neighed nervously. Stop honking, shouted Tina. You're scaring our horses. The man gave her a disdainful look. I honk the horn when it suits me, he growled. He eyed Roger, who had come running out of the stable at the sound of the horn. Before Tina could say anything back, the man waved impatiently and shouted, Hey there, stable boy, bring this luggage here to my little girl's room. Roger was not the type to get easily upset, but his face frowned annoyed at the man's remark. Are you talking to me? Well, of course. There's no other staff around, the man yapped back. And make it a bit quick. I don't have forever. I got more important things to do than standing around here. Roger, refusing to be pushed around, came strolling across the yard at a slow, deliberate pace. You can pack at least six of these suitcases back in the car, he remarked coolly. There's no space for those in our shared rooms. The little girl, who until now had been gazing aimlessly into the distance with a sour look on her face, seemed to suddenly come to life. I have to share a bedroom, she screamed. I don't want to stay here, Daddy. I want to go home. Daddy's handling this, little princess. The man tried to calm her down. You know I don't have time for you right now. Once I find a nice place for my new super luxury club hotel, I can take care of you again, but not before that. Until then, you have to stay here. He patted her dark curly head with his right hand, turned back to Roger, and in a businesslike tone asserted, I'm sure we can still swing something. If I pay you double or triple what you're getting, there should be a single room available. But Roger shook his head decidedly. Sorry, we're fully booked and we don't make exceptions for anyone else here either. I don't think you know who you're dealing with, the man growled. A vein in his forehead swelled menacingly. I'm Jake Overland, building contractor, and for my daughter Fiona, there's only the best. You can be sure of that. Dark Plans Alex galloped Maharaja across the countryside and through the meadows beyond Falkenstein Castle. Once they had passed the old oak, Alex eased up the pace of his stallion, having made up for the time he'd lost at home searching for his tent. After a short while, Alex arrived at the dirt track behind Martin's farm and rode on at a light trot. He too was surprised by the car parked behind the courtyard entrance, but at the slower pace, he was able to lead Maharaja to step and steer him gently past the rear of the luxury automobile. Good job, Maharaja, Alex praised his horse and patted his neck. He dismounted and gave the black horse a few oatmeal treats, which he kept in the pocket of his riding jacket. While Maharaja was chomping the treats with relish, Alex looked around. What was this car doing here? And what's more, right in front of the driveway? Just then, the stable door opened. Alex's heart leapt for joy at the sight of Tina as it always did. He wanted to rush towards her, but hesitated when he saw the look on her face. Without a doubt, 
Tina was in a bad mood. Alex wondered if he had done something wrong, but couldn't think of anything. Something had surely ruffled her feathers. Bibi, who left the stable next to Tina, also looked rather grumpy. Hello, Tina, Alex shouted to his girlfriend. He gave her his best smile and went over to the two girls, leading Maharaja by the reins. Hi, answered Tina briefly. What's wrong? Alex asked. Better not ask, sighed Tina. We have a little spoiled pink princess here, explained Bibi, who had noticed the worried look on Alex's face. Then she told him about the new guest, Fiona, and her rich father, the building contractor, Jake Overland. When she first saw her room, she didn't think it was good enough. Then she didn't want to wear boots. She was wearing ballerina slippers, Tina added, shaking her head. Pink ballerina slippers at riding school? And we just picked out a horse with her, Bibi continued. Our Snoopy is a really cute pony, but... Before Bibi could get any further, a little girl's shrill voice cut through their conversation. Alex understood immediately why Bibi and Tina were in such a bad mood. You see, Daddy? That there is a real horse, not a pony or a big old nag like that gray horse or that chestnut. The girl, who had left the stable alongside her father, pointed at Maharaja. It was all too clear who she had called Old Nag, and Alex saw Tina's expression turn ice cold. My Amadeus is not an old nag, she hissed. And neither is my Sabrina, Bibi added with an angry spark in her eyes. Well, I would ride them if I had to, said Fiona snottily. But I'm certainly not going to sit on a pony, and certainly not on a shabby circus mule like Snoopy. Bibi and Tina were already taking a breath to give Fiona a peppery answer when Roger put an end to the debate. He had been the last to leave the stable, slamming the gate loudly into the lock as he did so. Either you ride Snoopy, or you don't ride at all, he said curtly to Fiona, and it's time for you to get changed for the outing. The girl was not used to being talked to in this way. She threw an offended look at her father, and he reacted immediately. I advise you to take a different tone with my daughter, he barked at Roger. He returned to Fiona and patted her hand. I know you'd rather be at home or at that country club you usually go to, but please don't give Daddy any trouble, okay? I'll be back soon, and if you're good, you'll get that nice pink phone you've been wanting for a long time. What do you say? Is that a good idea? Fiona pulled a face, but nodded and followed Roger into the house without further protest. Goodbye, my little princess, Mr. Overland called after her. In his thoughts, however... The contractor seemed to have long since left his daughter. His gaze wandered searchingly over the yard and the grounds around it. He coolly examined the surroundings as if he were quietly figuring out a math equation. Am I closer to solving my problem than I thought? He finally muttered. Turning to the children, he said aloud, It's a pity that this place is not being used effectively. You could really make something out of it here. Excuse me, Tina protested. Make what out of it? Are you saying Martin's farm doesn't amount to anything? Not if you think in my dimensions, said Jake Overland. And in what dimensions do you think? Alex asked carefully. Only in the very biggest, cried the contractor. Think about it. How many guests can this farm have? Ten? Twenty? I'm thinking of several hundred well-paying guests, and everything should be top-notch. We could never accommodate that many guests here, remarked Tina. No, not at the moment, replied Mr. Overland. But if it were up to me, then you could. Bibi became increasingly uncomfortable around the building contractor. And what exactly is your idea? She asked critically. Mr. Overland put on a businesslike face again. I've long been planning a luxury country club for international clientele. I think this would be the perfect place for it but you'd really have to clean it up properly. The country house, for example, isn't so bad, he said, pointing to the main house. The framework of the building can be preserved. Some people really like that rustic feel, but of course the entire thing has to be rebuilt and integrated into a modern hotel complex. Bibi, Tina, and Alex could hardly believe what they heard, but if they had thought that Mr. Overland was at the end of his speech, they had been mistaken. He was just getting started. The stables must be completely removed, he continued, animated. 
This is a wrecking ball case. We'll put a state-of-the-art spa there with everything from thermal baths and saunas to a massage center. But the highlight is, of course, this landscape. It's made for an exclusive golf course. I can see it already. The three friends stared at each other, dumbfounded. Bibi was the first to find her words. Then, <clears throat> she began, but had to clear her throat. Then we can be glad that Martin's farm isn't yours. Not yet. Mr. Overland smiled arrogantly. But that shouldn't be a problem. I'll talk to the current owner as soon as possible. I finally found what I've been looking for for so long. The current owner won't even give you the time of day, Alex retorted. He's my father, Count Falko von Falkenstein. And our family doesn't just happen to own this land now, but has for over the past 750 years. This land is our heritage. This made no impression on Mr. Overland whatsoever. Count Falco von Falkenstein, eh? He murmured. I'd better pay him a visit right away. With these words, he simply left the three children and walked over to his car. Oh, I'd like to flatten all his tires, cried Bibi, who was now boiling with rage. Or I'll turn him into a frog, or better yet, an earthworm. Eeny, meeny, slimy germ, once a builder, now a... Tina snapped out of her daze when she heard the spell. Stop, Bibi, she interrupted. Besides... We can rest easy, Alex said. My father would never sell the land to that loser, even if he gave him all the money in the world. The Construction Lion Roars Jake Overland revved his car at breakneck speed along the country road. He always drove much too fast, but now that he could smell success, envisioning his building plans for Martin's farm, he pushed down even harder on the accelerator. This Martin's farm is a gold mine, he thought. If one did it right, and he was convinced that he had always done everything right in his life, one could make an absolute fortune. If only this count would play along. But he would. Certainly this Falkenstein fellow was not only a nobleman, but also a clever businessman. With his racing momentum, the contractor almost missed the exit leading to the castle. He swung the steering wheel around and peeled into the turn with squealing tires. The road wound up the hill in sharp, S-like curves. At the last one, Jake Overland spotted the castle with its high towers and battlements. Anyone else who saw it for the first time was struck by the fairy tale sight with an admiring, ooh, and ah. But it seemed to make no impression whatsoever on Mr. Overland. The first challenge, thought the contractor, was likely to get permission to see the Count at all, seeing as how the majority of servants always acted like the toughest of guard dogs. Once he had made it past the first hurdle, the contractor knew from experience that he'd have to pay extra attention to striking up the right tone with the Count. So far in his career, that hadn't been a problem. When it came to business, he always found the right words. He was in his element. This time won't be any different, he thought as he headed for the castle gate at far too fast a pace. I've already got the Martin farm practically in my pocket. It would be absurd if that run-down, pathetic riding stable couldn't be turned into a luxury vacation resort for international jet-setters. We'd all make a killing in profits. Mr. Overland shot through the gate in his luxury sedan, and with a swift yank on the emergency brake, came to a skidding stop directly in front of the castle stairs. He heaved his compact yet massive body out of the driver's seat, slammed the car door with a bang, and spurred up the steps to the entrance, a maneuver which left him quite out of breath. Three times he pressed his thick finger impatiently on the doorbell. By his measure, it already took far too long for anything to happen in the castle. Man, oh man, oh man, he thought. These high society guys sure take their time, and yet everyone knows that time is money. Soft steps were approaching from within, and Butler Eckelbert opened the door. Although he had put on a courteous face, he was annoyed at the impatient ringing of the bell. May I help you? he asked succinctly. I would like to see the Count, and I want to see him now, urged the contractor. Sorry, said the butler, but the Count is not available for anyone. I guarantee he'll want to talk to me. Jake Overland bent over with a conspiratorial expression and whispered into the butler's ear. After all, it's about his family's inheritance. You mean the family history of Falkenstein, 
Ekelbert raised an eyebrow in surprise. You could put it that way, the contractor replied glibly. It's regarding business of historical significance and Falkenstein's ancestors, to say the very least. At these words, the butler's face relaxed a little. Then you are the historian the Count is expecting. Please come in, Professor. With a bow, the butler opened the door completely, and Mr. Overland entered. It seemed a bit awkward to him that he was now considered a historian, but it was for the best. He had cleared the first hurdle and was admitted to the Count. If you will please follow me, the Count is in the library, said the butler, and walked gracefully through the hall. On the first floor, Butler Ecclebert knocked on the library door, and after an energetic, Come in! He opened it. Here you are, sir, he said, and let Mr. Overland enter. Count Falco von Falkenstein was sitting at his desk, buried in a pile of papers. He adjusted his monocle and looked up. He stopped when he saw the building contractor. Cuckoo? he asked. This put Mr. Overland a little off his game. He had definitely met some quirky gentlemen during his professional career, but nobody had yet greeted him with cuckoo. So, ah, uh, he began, stammering. But then he pulled himself together and called out with a cheerful businessman's smile. Yeah, cuckoo. I guess I'd better get right to the point. It's about Martin's farm. And at once the words gushed out of him. Just a moment ago, the Count had been reading a complicated medieval document composed in Latin. The sound of his butler knocking on the door had brought him back several hundred years into the present. Now there was someone standing in front of him who did not look at all like how he had imagined Professor Albertus Cuckoo. And what was he ranting about? This robust little man spoke without a single period or comma, and thus far the Count only gathered that it was obviously something about Martin's farm. Please, not so fast, he interrupted him. You must take into account my limited historical knowledge. He offered Mr. Overland a chair, into which he let himself sink clumsily. Once again, slowly and from the beginning, the contractor began reiterating his concern. It's about Martin's farm and the surrounding area. Excellent, cried the Count, who once again completely misunderstood him. For I have just been reviewing that as well. Here, look. He slid a stack of paperwork to Mr. Overland, who, however, could not understand a word of the Latin text. Falco von Falkenstein tapped on a spot at the bottom of the page. You see? Here is something about my great ancestor Francis von Falkenstein. Apparently he was in constant feud with his landlord and steward, a certain Oswald Overland. Overland? Could even be an ancestor of mine, the contractor chuckled. Now Falco von Falkenstein was truly confused. Didn't you say your name was Cuckoo? Mr. Overland shook his head. No, 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 my good man. You said Cuckoo, and then I said Cuckoo. But my name is Overland. I'm a building contractor, Jake Overland. A contractor, are you? Asked the Count, his face grimacing. What do you want from me? Mr. Overland looked at him with bewilderment. Well, I just told you. I'm here to buy Martin's farm from you. For a moment there was silence. Then the corner of Falco von Falkenstein's mouth began to twitch until he finally burst into resounding laughter. Buy Martin's farm, he cried, tears welling in his eyes from continued laughter. Martin's farm? Buy Martin's farm from me? Mr. Overland shifted back and forth in his chair, unsettled. What was so funny? He had made the Count a normal business offer and now the entire situation seemed somehow upended. He was right about that. After Count Falco von Falkenstein had finished dabbing the tears from the corners of his eyes with a handkerchief, his face suddenly became hard and dismissive. I think our conversation is over, he stated coolly. Ecclebert will escort you to the door. Uh, yes, but... Uh, the contractor stammered. Fare thee well, Mr. Underland, bid the Count. My name is Overland protested the contractor. Falco von Falkenstein stood up with a stern expression on his face, and Mr. Overland stood up too. You really should reconsider my proposal. He made one last attempt to change the Count's mind. There is nothing to think about, Mr. Underland. Overland! Whatever! Falco von Falkenstein was now really upset. I'll never sell my family's land, neither to an upper, under, or otherwise. And now, adieu! 
With this, he turned away from the contractor and rang for the butler, who appeared almost immediately. Before he could finish his usual, Your wish? Count Falco cut him off angrily. Ecclebert, is it so difficult to remember the few instructions I gave? First, do not dust in the library. Two, do not disturb my nap. And three, do not let anyone in except Professor Cuckoo. That can't be so difficult, you nincompoop. Excuse me, sir, offered the butler apologetically. But I assumed that this gentleman... You will now escort this gentleman to the door, and then I don't want to be disturbed any further, thundered the Count. Mr. Overland did not quite understand what exactly had gone wrong during the conversation. At the moment, he knew only that the Count had rebuffed him. Him, contractor Jake Overland. He, who had never been treated so condescendingly in his life. What was the Count thinking? An irrepressible rage rose in him, and a vein in his temple began to throb menacingly. Before he left the library, he turned once more to the Count, who had already sat back down at his desk. You, you arrogant fop, roared the construction lion. You'll be hearing from me. A Cuckoo in the Bush You want me to clean Snoopy myself? Ugh. Fiona looked at Bibi in disbelief. Not only was she supposed to be riding a horse and not a pony, but now she actually had to do the work that was part of the service at her country club. But it's so much fun, said Bibi with disbelief. She turned back to the other children and helped them scratch out their hooves and saddle their ponies. Fiona was furious. Where had her father dumped her? If she couldn't spend her summer vacation with him, she was at least used to putting her dirty riding boots outside her door in the evening and getting them back shiny again the next morning. And when she wanted to go riding, the horses were always groomed and bridled. Now she had to do all this herself? The only thing missing was that she also had to help clean the stables. Pouting, she grabbed her grooming brush and pulled so hard through Snoopy's mane that the pony whinnied uncomfortably. Careful, Fiona, reminded Tina. Brush along the hairline and very gently. I know how to do it, Fiona moaned. But Tina had long since noticed that the contractor's daughter had clearly never cleaned a horse. Tina had to pull herself together not to deliver a sharp remark. Her mother had specifically requested her to do so earlier. Mrs. Martin had also noticed how exhausting Fiona could be, but she was, after all, a guest at Martin's farm. You can point out her mistakes in a friendly but firm way, Mrs. Martin had advised B.B., Tina, and Alex, and please avoid anything that might make the situation more difficult. That's what the three had promised her, and so Tina now patiently explained to Fiona how to groom the coat, hold Snoopy's hooves so she could scratch them out, and show her how to put the saddle cloth on properly, then buckle the saddle. Finally, they put the bridle on together. After Fiona had put on her riding helmet, Tina helped her into the saddle, she could tell straight away that the girl had not had any real lessons at her fancy country club. Take the reins shorter, Tina reminded her. Otherwise, you'll have too little contact with your pony. You're also sitting too far back in the saddle. Only with some reluctance did Fiona follow the instructions. Tina suspected that she would have to keep an eye on Fiona more often during their outing and correct her posture mistakes while riding. We're ready, Alex shouted over to Bibi and Tina. Together with Roger, he had harnessed the two ponies, Max and Moritz, in front of the wagon and loaded the camp children's luggage. Max and Moritz whinnied impatiently. They could hardly wait to finally start the trip. We're ready to go too, B.B. called back. Everyone was now in the saddle and lined up in the order that B.B., Tina, and Alex had thought of before. B.B. rode Sabrina in front, followed by Lena on Little Shetty, a boy named Lucas on Polly, and Fiona on Snoopy. Tina lined up behind Fiona, where she could keep them in good view. Behind Tina was the wagon with three six-year-old girls and Linus, who steered it. The boy was burning with excitement. He had often sat next to Roger up on the Martins Farm carriage and was already an excellent driver. Now he was mighty proud of his entrusted duty. Alex would ride next to him most of the time and could intervene if something went wrong, which was never really an issue. Max and Moritz hardly ever seemed to get agitated by anything. Bye, have fun and see you later, shouted Roger. He would come by later in the evening and check in with the kids if everything was all right. 
Mrs. Martin also came out of the house and waved goodbye. Bibi led the troops from the farm. They headed down the road for a while before turning onto a dirt lane. The path led through the forest to the mill stream, and the group decided to follow its course to the old mill. At this leisurely pace, it took them almost a full hour to cross the forest. When they heard the murmur of the mill stream, Bibi raised her hand, motioning everyone to stop. Time for a picnic, she shouted. Together with the camp children, Bibi, Tina, and Alex built a makeshift paddock and let the horses graze. They spread out picnic blankets and sat on them. Tina handed out paper plates and cups. Bibi unpacked the sandwiches that Mrs. Martin had prepared for the group, and Alex served apple juice. After they had all eaten, the kids stretched out on the blankets, squinting in the warm sun and listening to the frogs squawking in the reeds by the mill stream. A brimstone butterfly settled on Bibi's nose and only fluttered away again when Bibi had to sneeze. Laughing, her eyes followed the butterfly's path through the air. It was then that she noticed that, further back, along a dirt path, someone was crawling around between the bushes and feeling the ground. Bibi poked Tina with her elbow. Look at that man there. He's looking for something. Alex had also noticed him. The three friends got up and went over to the man. Hello? Tina shouted to him. Is there anything we can do to help? Uh, what's that? The man didn't seem to even notice the children had approached him. Startled, he righted himself through the thick branches of a jasmine bush. The white flowers swirled around him and stuck everywhere. In his gray hair, which stood wildly on end, on the lenses of his horn-rimmed glasses, and on his checked jacket. Confused, he looked from one child to another, but through his smudged glasses could not make out who was standing in front of him. He cleaned them laboriously and put them back on his nose. Oh, how lovely, he remarked afterwards. May I? Cuckoo. Bibi and Tina threw each other a confused look. Only Alex had understood, now that the man had told him his name. He remembered that his father had mentioned a professor called Cuckoo earlier. Are you the historian who's supposed to help my father? He asked. In fact, I, I am a historian, cried Professor Cuckoo. But who are you? Now Bibi, Tina, and Alex also introduced themselves. Professor Cuckoo told them how he was on his bicycle heading to Falkenstein Castle when he had missed the turnoff and wanted to study the map again. But what were you doing in those bushes? Asked Bibi. My glasses, Professor Cuckoo replied. Without them, I can't read the map. Bibi and Tina winked at each other amusedly. This was one absent-minded professor. But sir, you have the glasses on your nose, Tina helped him. Astonished, the professor groped for the frame. Indeed, he murmured, taking off his glasses. But then he shook his head. Oh, no, 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 these are my glasses for seeing far away, he explained. If I want to read, I need my glasses for seeing close up. And these glasses for seeing close up? Are they the ones in your pocket? Asked Bibi, pointing to another pair that was sticking out of the side pocket of the man's jacket. Oh, <laughs> well, 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 mumbled the professor and took off his glasses. I usually put them in my left inside pocket. What are they doing in the outside pocket now? He took off the far-sighted glasses and put on the other glasses. And the far-sighted glasses, do you usually keep them in your left inside pocket? Alex asked. Yes, of course. Uh, all my glasses belong in the inner left pocket, explained the professor. That way I can find them much faster. I'm only asking because you've just put the far-sighted glasses in your outside pocket, Alex said with a smile. The professor looked surprised. I'll be darned. Well observed, he shouted. Can I hire you as my assistants? Because I'm always moving things and then finding them in the most impossible places. The professor and the kids looked over the map together. As it turned out, it was the wrong map but Bibi, Tina, and Alex were able to help him anyway. They explained to him that he had to cycle back towards Falkenstein, where he'd soon find a turn-off on the right side leading up to the castle. Professor Cuckoo thanked the children and climbed onto his rickety old bicycle. Bibi, Tina, and Alex waved after him before they went back to the children, and the professor rang his rusty bike bell to say goodbye. He wasn't a very good cyclist, wobbling back and forth with every pedal stroke, but that wouldn't be a problem. The country roads around Falkenstein were practically deserted, and if someone was driving, he or she was generally not in any great hurry. The professor had already become accustomed to the pleasurable silence of the countryside, and therefore flinched when he suddenly heard a wild engine roar and squealing tires. 
a big shiny blue car came racing down the winding road from the direction of the castle. It was swerving into the opposite lane, and the driver did not notice the tottering professor until the last minute. With a hard break, the car came to a skidding halt just in front of his bicycle. The professor was so shocked that he forgot to pedal, and with a boop, simply fell sideways. This time, the far-sighted glasses actually flew from his nose and he began to grope helplessly for them in the grass beside the road. He heard the driver get out of the car and approach him, ranting as he came nearer. My, 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 man, if you were a motorist, I'd have said you won a driver's license in the lottery. The professor, who had found his glasses again and was about to put them on his face, paused in surprise. He knew that voice. When the driver reached out to help him, the professor grabbed his arm and was swung upwards. You're kidding! I can't believe it, cried the driver, if it isn't my old friend Albertus Cuckoo. The professor put on his glasses and shouted in surprise. Well, well, if it isn't the good-for-nothing Jake, Jake Overland, who always stole my marbles. Oh, no, it wasn't like that, the contractor protested, laughing. I won them all fair and square, but tell me, are you the cuckoo that this count is expecting up at his castle? Indeed I am, confirmed the professor. By the way, I was thinking about you recently. I am currently researching the family history of Count von Falkenstein. In some old documents, there is actually talk about one of your ancestors, Oswald Overland, the steward of the Count's family in the Middle Ages. One source even reports that Francis von Falkenstein is said to have transferred land to him. But this is probably only a legend because a legally valid document with the seal of Francis has never appeared anywhere before. Mr. Overland listened attentively to these words. Well, well, that's interesting, he murmured. Albertus, he suddenly exclaimed, you must tell me more about this. First thing tomorrow, I'm coming up there to visit you in that old shack. Professor Cuckoo hesitated. He didn't know the Count and wondered if it would be appropriate for him to receive visitors at the castle. Uh, perhaps I should ask the Count's permission first, he objected. But Mr. Overland wiped away all doubts with a sweeping gesture of his hand. Let's not make it so complicated, he shouted. I know that the Count takes his afternoon nap every day. Tomorrow I'll be by your side, and the Count won't give it a second thought. Professor Cuckoo wanted to reply, but Mr. Overland did not let him speak. With a, bye, Albertus, he jumped into his car, roared off and was out of sight around the next bend. Under the Starry Sky After their picnic, Bibi, Tina, and Alex set off again together with the rest of the children. A short while later, they reached their destination, the meadow at the mill pond. There they wanted to set up camp. They found a nice place for the paddock, and after unsaddling their horses and ponies, they let them graze in the fresh green meadow. They pitched their tents a little way from the bank of the pond. After all the children had unpacked and arranged their belongings, they gathered dry branches and twigs in the grove to build a campfire for cooking dinner. They roasted delicious potatoes, which they placed in the embers, and marshmallows, which sizzled on long sticks over the fire. The children had a lot of fun. Only Fiona seemed to have a problem with everything. Bibi, Tina, and Alex tried to be friendly to the girl, but when Fiona pushed the plate of food away from her with a bratty moan, Bibi finally let out a remark. I don't know what your problem is. Everybody enjoys it here but you. You're also the only one who doesn't appreciate the food. I don't like this, Fiona sulked. Man, you're a real spoil sport, Linus laid into her. Fiona also began to spoil the mood for the other kids at the camp. If you don't want to eat, why don't you just go to bed, Luke added. Hey guys, don't fight, Tina tried to mediate. At this, Fiona barked, I'll just go to sleep then, you're all stupid anyway. She got up and ran over to her tent. Bibi wanted to follow her, but Tina held her back. Don't, Bibi, she whispered to a friend. Let her sulk a bit. Tomorrow she'll calm down again, and then we'll try to talk to her reasonably. All right, Bibi sighed and sat back down in the grass. The fight with Fiona was soon forgotten. They sat around the campfire until late in the evening and told exciting stories. When the sun had almost set, a rider approached. It was Roger on Pascal, who wanted to know if everything was okay. 
he warned the children about going to bed too late, wished everyone a good night, and then rode back to Martin's farm to help his mother with the other camp guests. Bibi, Tina, and Alex sat together around the campfire for quite a while. They listened to the crackling and snapping of the fire, mesmerized by the flickering flames. The stars sparkled in the night black sky and reflected in the water of the mill pond. There, a shooting star, cried Tina. Now you can make a wish, Bibi reminded her. Tina closed her eyes. She knew immediately what she would wish for, that it would stay this beautiful forever, with her boyfriend Alex and her best friend Bibi, with her mother and Roger at their beloved Martin's farm. Well, what did you wish for? Alex asked curiously as Tina opened her eyes again. I can't tell you, replied his girlfriend. Otherwise, the wish will not come true. Suddenly, one of the ponies in the paddock started neighing. Amadeus and Sabrina joined in. Maharaja also snorted loudly. Bibi, Tina, and Alex looked around but couldn't see anything that might have frightened the horses. Everything's okay, shouted Bibi to the horses, who calmed down. The three sat there in silence and looked out at the mill pond. The trouble with Fiona seemed far behind them now. No one gave a second thought anymore to the girl, who they figured was already fast asleep like the other children. But they were wrong. Fiona had crawled into her sleeping bag and, sulking, pulled a zipper up over her nose. But she could not sleep. She was angry. The things those camp kids come up with. To tell her she was irritating. They were the ones who were annoying, and Bibi, Tina, and Alex could beat it. She wouldn't last one day longer with them. As she was lying alone in her tent, the thought suddenly occurred to her to leave. But how could she do that? She wouldn't get far on foot. No, not on foot, she thought. But she still had Snoopy. She didn't like him much, but he was better than no horse at all. Fiona could barely contain her excitement. She would have loved to go outside immediately, grab Snoopy and ride away. But she had to wait until the other children had gone to bed, and that lasted for quite a while. Finally, the two girls with whom she shared the tent came in. Fiona pretended to be asleep. The two of them slipped into their sleeping bags and whispered quietly to each other. Not long after, Fiona could hear the rhythm of their breathing and knew they had both fallen asleep. It was also very quiet in the neighboring tent. Only from the campfire could one still make out the distant voices of Bibi, Tina, and Alex. Fiona carefully pulled open the zipper on her sleeping bag. Earlier, she had gone to bed in riding pants and a t-shirt. Now she was happy about it because it meant she didn't have to change in the dark. She slipped on her sweater, which she had rolled up as a pillow on the mat, grabbed her small pink backpack, which had been lying next to her head, and groped her way to the tent exit. Fiona had to be careful not to bump into one of the sleeping girls and wake her up. Her fingers found the tent zipper. Slowly, she pulled it up just a little bit, slipped out, and zipped it shut. Once outside, Fiona pulled on her riding boots, which she had left in front of the tent, and crept over to the paddock. Snoopy had dozed off standing upright just on the other side of the fence. After their arrival, the children had put the bridles and the saddles over a fallen tree trunk. Fiona still knew where Snoopy's tack was. She clamped the bridle under her arm, picked up the heavy saddle and saddlecloth, and climbed over the fence. Now she was glad that Tina had explained to her at Martin's farm how to saddle Snoopy and put the bridle on. The pony seemed to find this nocturnal disturbance irritating. He stomped restlessly from one hoof to the other. Fiona tightened the girth, but when she pulled the bridle straps over Snoopy's head, he protested with a neigh. This prompted Sabrina and Amadeus to give their own response, and Maharaja also chimed in with a loud snort. Fiona winced and ducked behind the back of the pony. Bibi, Tina, and Alex could of course hear the neighing. Would they come and see what was going on? It seemed like an eternity until she finally heard Bibi assuring, Everything is all right. In fact, the horses even seemed to calm down again. Fiona took Snoopy by the reins and led him to the edge of the makeshift paddock. She chose the side facing away from the mill pond. Bibi, Tina, and Alex didn't notice how she pulled one of the lightweight poles out of the ground, let Snoopy step over the rope, and then put the pole back in. Fiona led Snoopy a little bit further, then put her left foot in the stirrup and pulled herself up. She managed to swing herself into the saddle on the first try and squeezed hard several times with her heels when it appeared Snoopy didn't want to move. He finally gave in and set forth at a slow walking pace. 
one couldn't make him go any faster, even if they wanted to. Neither Fiona nor her pony could see the forest floor in the darkness. Snoopy kept bumping his hooves against thick roots or slipping when the ground was uneven. When the forest cleared, Fiona could see in the starlight that their course was going uphill. Snoopy patiently made the climb, but when they had reached the top of the hill, only rocks and boulders were spread out in front of them, and the pony refused to go any further. No matter how hard Fiona pushed Snoopy, he simply wouldn't budge. This wouldn't have happened to me with a real horse, she scolded and hopped off. She tugged at Snoopy's reins, but even now the pony didn't want to move again. You are going to move! Now go! shouted Fiona, but all she could do was make Snoopy anxious. She yanked on the reins quickly and firmly, but succeeded only in agitating the pony even further. It whinnied and reared. Startled, Fiona jumped back. She hadn't noticed that she was standing right next to the edge of a rock. Her foot went down, but misjudged the step entirely. She slipped, fell lengthwise, and slid even further, hitting the bottom hard and getting her right foot caught in a crevice. She screamed in pain. Up on the rock, Snoopy fell silent. He looked down at Fiona in the darkness and snorted as if to ask if she was all right. The girl saw him high above her against the starry sky. Snoopy, she cried helplessly. She tugged at her leg and tried to free her foot from the crevice, but in vain. It took a moment before she truly understood what had happened. Panic rose up inside of her. She was all alone between those rocks. Without help, she would never get out of there. A Savior in Need A few glowing embers were all that was left of the campfire at Mill Pond. Bibi, Tina, and Alex had not noticed how late it was. Alex had just glanced at his wristwatch, about to suggest it was time for them to go to sleep, when a neighing could be heard from off in the distance. Is there a horse running free? Tina asked, puzzled. She knew that there were no paddocks near the old mill. Moreover, the neighing was getting closer and closer, until, without warning, a gray pony shot out between the bushes and ran across the meadow towards the three children. Snoopy! cried Bibi in surprise. The pony threw his head back upright and neighed as loud as he could, stomping excitedly with his hooves. Whoa, Snoopy! Alex tried to calm the nervous pony. You'll wake up the kids! But that had already happened. One after the other, zippers were going up at the entrances of the three guest tents and sleepy faces began peering out. Snoopy still whinnied, and the children began to whisper excitedly to each other. He must have escaped from the paddock. Tina considered. But why is he saddled? At that moment, they heard loud voices. The two girls who shared the tent with Fiona came running over to Bibi, Tina, and Alex. Fiona is gone, they shouted, and she took her backpack with her. At once, the three friends realized what this meant. Fiona had run away. She had taken Snoopy out of the paddock, saddled him, and ridden away. But why had the pony returned alone? There was really only one explanation. Something must have happened to Fiona. She can't ride very well, Tina said. Maybe she fell. The whole camp was now stirring. The other kids also came out of their tents and chatted wildly. Snoopy whinnied again and pointed his head toward the forest. He wants to lead us to Fiona, cried Alex. Yes, Bibi agreed. We have to follow him. Alex will stay here with the children, and Bibi and I will go looking for Fiona, Tina quickly decided. And if we don't find her, we must tell Roger and my mother. But first, let's try this. Bibi and Tina got their flashlights and followed Snoopy, who had already walked to the edge of the meadow. Take good care of yourselves, Alex shouted after them. Snoopy seemed relieved that the children had finally understood what he wanted from them. He let himself be taken by the reins, but pushed forward in a hurry. Bibi and Tina had trouble keeping up with him. We can't go as fast as you, Snoopy, complained Tina. We only have two legs. But Snoopy did not let up. He leaned on the reins and led the two girls through the forest, snorting loudly. Fiona was nearly in despair. Snoopy had watched her from above and neighed a few more times. She had tried to explain to him that she was stuck and could not climb back up. But of course the pony couldn't understand that. Or had he? Snoopy had suddenly run away, and the night around Fiona fell still. She let herself sink to the ground and began to cry bitterly. Never before had she felt so lonely and abandoned. The wind had picked up quite a bit, whistling and howling around the rocks. 
Although Fiona was wearing her sweater, she soon began to freeze. The rocky ground beneath her was cold, and she shivered all over her body. Surely the other children would only notice the next morning that she was not in her tent. Only then would Bibi, Tina, and Alex start looking for her. Slowly, Fiona realized what an unbelievably stupid thing she had done. Running away, in the middle of the night. She was cold and her foot hurt. And what would her father say to all this? Would he even miss her? He never had time for her, she thought. Tears were streaming down her cheeks. She cried so loudly that at first she didn't even hear the neighing that approached the rocks. But then she heard the clattering of hooves and two familiar voices. Fiona! cried Bibi and Tina. Fiona, where are you? The two of them had actually already started looking for her. I'm down here, she wailed loudly. I've slipped down the rock. My foot's stuck. I can't move it. From above, the head of the little pony appeared, and next to it, the faces of Bibi and Tina. Snoopy let out an encouraging whinny at Fiona. We'll get you back up in no time, cried Tina. But Bibi and Tina quickly discovered that it was easier said than done. Fiona was only a short distance below them, but the rock was slippery, and there was a good chance that the two girls would slip off as well during the rescue effort. We need a rope to pull her up, Tina said. We have one on the ladder truck, but it will take quite a long time if we have to walk back to the camp first. Besides, we can't pull her up that easily, Bibi objected. We have to climb down and check her foot. She looked at her friend with a serious expression. Don't you think this is an emergency now? Tina knew what she was getting at. Bibi had promised Mrs. Martin a long time ago not to use magic on the farm and on the rides. Only in an extreme emergency would Tina's mother make an exception. And this situation, which Tina saw just as clearly as Bibi, was definitely an emergency. Fiona had possibly injured herself and needed help quickly. Go on then, Tina said to her friend. Do it now. On the spot, Bibi stretched out her hands and began a spell. Eeny, meeny, dogfish bladder, from the rock an iron ladder, whiz, whiz. Sparkling magic stars surged along the rock from Bibi's fingers with a whooshing sound, and at once, iron rungs appeared in the stone. Fiona couldn't believe her eyes when Bibi and Tina descended the magic ladder to her side. Snoopy snorted excitedly. Come, lean on my shoulder, Tina told Fiona when they arrived at the bottom. Fiona held on to her while Bibi and Tina moved her leg carefully. Her foot was wedged in the crevice, and the two friends had to turn it gently to pull it out. At last, Fiona was free again. She tried to stand up, and to her relief became aware that the foot was apparently not broken. It hurt a bit, but that, Tina said, would probably just be a sprain. Bibi was the first to climb up the ladder. Fiona followed close behind her, and after that came Tina, who supported her while climbing. Fiona couldn't believe she was saved so quickly. While they were still climbing up the ladder, she asked Bibi and Tina how they knew to go looking for her in the middle of the night. Yeah, you got Snoopy to thank for that, answered Bibi with a laugh. He immediately ran to the tent camp and alarmed us, Tina explained. Snoopy saved me, Fiona thought, and all of a sudden she felt warm in her heart. So the pony had not abandoned her as she had feared. On the contrary, he had been worried about Fiona and had gone for help. Arriving on top of the rock, Snoopy greeted the girl. He nudged her with his velvety snout and gave a cheerful whinny. My dear Snoopy, cried Fiona, squeezing her arms around the pony's neck. You saved me. You're the greatest pony in the world. The Seal Happy shouting and laughing pervaded the camp. It was almost noon. Alex had marked out a slalom course in the meadow on the opposite bank of the mill pond and showed the children how to lead the ponies around the obstacles by only using their legs. Fiona didn't take part. After last night's shock, she had slept in late for the first time. Afterwards, Bibi and Tina took the opportunity to have a quiet chat with Fiona. To their surprise, the girl was quite agreeable. When the two friends finally asked her if she would rather go home, Fiona looked at them questioningly. You want me to leave? I mean, you're right. I really messed up. But Bibi and Tina had not meant it that way. They just thought Fiona had run away because she wanted to see her father again. They had no intention of sending her away, and they told her so. You're welcome to stay, but only under one condition, warned Tina. 
You'll never do anything like that what you did last night again. Fiona shook her head. No, I most certainly won't, she promised. What Fiona said sounded credible, and Bibi and Tina were relieved. For their part, they now promised not to tell anyone about the nighttime disappearance, not even Roger, who would surely come to bring lunch at any moment. This stays between us. We'll sort it out with the others, said Bibi. Fiona was visibly relieved, and for the two girls, the matter was settled. Fiona was desperate to check on Snoopy. She ran over to the paddock where the pony greeted her with a happy neigh. She stroked Snoopy and snuggled up against his neck. Looks like the two of them have become best friends, Bibi said happily. At the same time, lunch had just finished at Falkenstein Castle. Count Falco von Falkenstein dabbed his lips with a flower white napkin and leaned back comfortably in his chair. That was quite impressive, my dear Ecclebert, he praised his butler, who bowed and then began to clear the dishes. Allow me, Professor, to draw your attention to your spectacles, said Ecclebert as he reached for Albertus Cuckoo's plate. My glasses, the professor asked confusedly. Haven't I got them resting on my nose? One pair is, replied the butler, but the other one is lying here under your napkin. I'll be darned, shouted the professor and tried to put his nearsighted specks into his jacket. Left, the count reminded him. Excuse me? the professor asked. I thought you said you always kept your glasses in the inside left pocket. Just now you wanted to put them in the right pocket, Count Falco von Falkenstein smiled. In the short time they had been working together, he had already grown accustomed to the fact that the scatterbrained professor was constantly losing and looking for something. As long as he doesn't misplace any important documents, it's fine with me, the count thought amusedly. He was now comfortably full and sleepy, but before the count retired for his nap, he had to show the professor something he had discovered shortly before lunch. May I again request your opinion on a matter? He asked his guest. But at any time, kind sir, Professor Cuckoo assured. He was completely in his element here at the castle. There was nothing he liked better than to browse through books and examine old documents. But what Count Falco von Falkenstein had discovered was not a document. Upstairs in the library, the Count showed the professor his find, which had apparently been kept for centuries in a worm-eaten wooden box. Look, Professor, said the Count, and opened the lid. Hmm, I see, I see, muttered the historian as he bent over the box in suspense. Well, I'll be darned, he gushed out excitedly. Is it real? asked Count Falco von Falkenstein. I should think so, replied the Professor. Of course, I can only tell you more precise details once I have examined it. The Count handed him the box, and the historian sat down at his desk. There, beside a magnifying glass, lay the white gloves that the professor always put on when he touched sensitive documents. He slipped on the gloves and brought out of the box a flat, reddish-brown circular object, about the size of a chocolate cookie. He carefully laid it on the table and studied it closely. The object was engraved with a coat of arms from the von Falkenstein family. A falcon with an open beak. A Latin inscription ran in a circle around the coat of arms. It was worn out, but Professor Cuckoo could clearly read the word Franciscus. It seems, he said after a while, as if this is indeed the seal of Francis von Falkenstein. It must have fallen off an old document and someone has kept it in this box. The Count was beaming. It really was a sensational discovery. Only a few documents had ever been preserved from Francis, the grandson of the founder of the castle, and his seal was only known to the Count from a picture in a medieval chronicle. I'll try to decipher the inscription, promised Professor Cuckoo, who had already bent over the seal with a magnifying glass. Do that, do that, cried the Count. Meanwhile, I will withdraw for a while. See you later, Professor. Professor Cuckoo no longer answered. With zeal, he was already closely eyeing the inscription, letter by letter. Outside in the corridor, the Count reminded his butler once more that he did not want to be disturbed during his nap under any circumstances and went next door into his bedroom. There was silence in the castle for almost an hour, until suddenly the doorbell rang. When he opened the door, the butler was unpleasantly surprised to see the building contractor, Jake Overland, again standing in front of him. The Count is not available for anyone, pronounced Eckelbert briefly, and was about to close the door when the contractor shuffled up to him and stood in the middle of the doorway. 
Wait a minute, he said. I'm not here to see the Count. Then whom do you wish to speak to? The butler asked suspiciously. My good old friend Albertus Cuckoo, cried Mr. Overland. Or to put it in your words, the historian who is currently staying in your castle. Ecclebert should have notified the Count immediately. But hadn't he received strict instructions not to disturb Count Falco von Falkenstein during his catnap? Under no circumstances, and under no circumstances whatsoever? Before the butler had even thought the matter through, he was again astounded by Mr. Overland. Now let us not complicate things more than necessary, cried the contractor, gently pushing Ecclebert aside. Professor Cuckoo and I have an appointment. With that, he went straight through the hall to the stairs. But, the butler stammered and hurried after the contractor. You can't just, oh, but I can, laughed Mr. Big Shot cheekily and hurried up the stairs to the first floor. The butler was unable to overtake the contractor before he reached the library. With a booming, good day, Albertus, the stout man ripped the door open. Startled, Professor Cuckoo jumped in his seat, sending the nearsighted glasses right off his nose. May, may I help you? he said, searching the direction of the door. He groped for his glasses, couldn't find them, and finally put on his farsighted pair. Only now did he recognize his old friend and schoolmate. Oh, it's you, Jake, he said. Relieved, Butler Ecclebert closed the door. Indeed, the professor seemed to be expecting the contractor, so everything seemed to be right. Meanwhile, Jake Overland had taken a seat next to Professor Cuckoo without being asked. So this is the paperwork you spend your short days with, he commented on the chaos on the desk. And what's this old thing? He pointed to the seal of Francis von Falkenstein. The historian began to talk about the sensational find. But why the seal was so unique did not interest the contractor. Instead, he wanted to learn about the lands that Francis von Falkenstein may have transferred to his ancestor, Oswald Overland. But Professor Cuckoo had to disappoint him. A legal document has not appeared, he said. I guess it's just a legend after all. Mr. Overland put an index finger to his fleshy nose and thought. He kept going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and so, so, until it suddenly dawned on him. Tell me, Albertus, what does such a legal document actually look like? Well, uh, Basically like this, Professor Cuckoo showed him the document of a descendant of Francis von Falkenstein, who had bequeathed the manor house to his faithful servant. The script itself is not the most important thing, he explained. The documents were written by a writing workshop. What is important is the seal. Without a seal, the document is worth nothing. Wax was dripped on the document and the family crest was embossed. A seal is usually firmly attached to the document, only sometimes when a seal has come off the paper, a seal without the writing can be found, like in our case here with the seal of Francis von Falkenstein. This was a little too complicated for Jake Overland, but at least he thought he had grasped the essentials. On a certificate for Oswald Overland, therefore, the seal of this Francis must be stuck on, he mused. A writing workshop will do the rest. Tell me, Albertus, is there still such a thing? And do you perhaps know somebody who does such a thing? Professor Cuckoo could not help with that. He only knew that sometimes such documents were made as props for medieval movies. But of course, without a seal, they are immediately recognizable as forgery, he added. Again, Mr. Overland put his index finger to his nose. Maybe an old buddy could help me there, he muttered to himself. Anyway, he owes me a favor. Out of the blue, he slapped the professor forcefully on the shoulder and shouted in a resounding voice, Thank you, Albertus. You've helped me a lot. The professor almost fell off his chair when he was hit, and it took him a short moment to pick himself up again. A short moment in which he did not see Mr. Overland take something from his desk and put it in the pocket of his suit. I won't keep you any longer, cried the contractor before rushing to the door. He threw it open vigorously and shouted a, Bye, my dear, on his way down the corridor. Professor Cuckoo didn't even know what had happened to him. His old friend and schoolmate came to visit him and left immediately. But what had he wanted? These businessmen are strange people, 
he thought with a sigh as he turned back to the seal of Francis von Falkenstein. At first he thought he was wearing the wrong glasses again when he couldn't find the seal on the desk in front of him. He switched the glasses on his nose with the glasses from the left inner pocket of his jacket, but that only made things worse. Regardless of the glasses he wore, the only thing in front of him was a mountain of old documents, but no seal. The professor began hastily shuffling through his jacket. Could he have accidentally put the seal in his pocket? No, it wasn't there, and it wasn't in the outside pockets either. Ugh, do I always have to move everything, he scolded, lowering himself on his knees to scan the floor. Count Falgo von Falkenstein had entrusted this seal to him. It was unique. It was irreplaceable. He had to find it if he searched every nook and cranny of this library. A Momentous Call Fiona had been a different person since the previous night. All day long, she had been so cheerful and friendly that the other children gradually forgot their differences and made peace with her. The last evening at the mill pond had already begun. After putting out the campfire, the children went to their tents, tired but happy. Bibi, Tina, and Alex also decided to go to bed earlier because they wanted a head start in the morning for the ride back to Martin's farm. Count Falgo von Falkenstein had also gone to bed early that evening. The sensational discovery in the ancient box had put him in high spirits all day long. But now he was tired and exhausted. Before his eyes closed, he had to think once more about how strangely his guest had behaved that afternoon. When asked whether Professor Cuckoo thought the seal of Francis von Falkenstein was real, the historian had muttered absent-mindedly, Yes, indeed, it looks like it. The Count had then turned to important administrative tasks in his office. When he returned to the library some time later, he had found the professor on the floor. Yes, uh, well, my glasses, the historian muttered. I think, once again, they are not where they should be. He's a scatterbrained oddball, thought the Count. No, he's not an oddball, he's cuckoo, scatterbrained and cuckoo. And with that, he fell asleep. At the same time, Professor Cuckoo was still in a state of agitation. He had explained to the Count that he wanted to continue working in the library for a while, but he hadn't made it that far yet. Instead, he had scanned the entire floor of the library twice, once with his close-up and once with his distance glasses, and still he had not been able to find the seal. The tricky thing was that he couldn't even remember when he had last seen it. A terrible idea occurred to him. Was it possible that he had switched the seal with the coffee cookie Echobird had brought him after lunch? Perhaps the butler had removed the empty cup and seal. Professor Cuckoo shuddered to even think it. What if the seal had landed with the cup in the dishwasher? Or the butler had thrown it in the trash with the other leftovers? Unimaginable! Of course he could not ask the butler about it. No, he had to find the seal all by himself. He would wait until the butler was in his room, and then he would search the castle kitchen. Well, the darn seal had to be somewhere. While Professor Cuckoo began to turn the castle upside down, the seal was long since somewhere else. It was lying in the middle of a pile of paperwork on the desk of Mr. Overland's buddy. After his visit to the castle, the building contractor had raced in his big shiny blue car to Redwell, where the buddy lived who still owed the contractor a favor. This buddy was an illustrator for Redwell Weekly and an ace at imitating old manuscripts. Mr. Overland had explained to him that the document he wanted to commission would be a funny present for a business friend. A joke, but it would have to look absolutely genuine and, above all, be finished by tomorrow. After he dictated the text to the draftsman, the man sat down at his desk. He took a sheet of parchment paper out of a drawer and began to write down the desired text letter by letter, neatly, with a fountain pen in black ink. There on the desk lay the seal, waiting to be stuck onto the document, a document that was neither a gift nor a joke, as Mr. Overland had claimed. With this document, the contractor wanted to pay Count Falco another visit, and Jake Overland was quite sure that this time he would have the Count's undivided attention. The next morning, Bibi, Tina, and Alex and the campers rode the shortest way across the meadows towards Martin's farm. When they arrived there, Tina's mother was already waiting for them at the front gate. Great to have you back, she exclaimed. Did everything go well? She asked her daughter privately a moment later. 
Tina knew who she was referring to with the question. Before the trip, they had all been worried about Fiona. A lot had happened in the meantime, but Bibi and Tina had not forgotten the promise they had made to Fiona. Not to tell anyone she had run away. I think she's settled in with us now, Tina replied. Mrs. Martin frowned. Really? she asked. So quickly? But then she saw Fiona laughing with the other children, and most of all, she noticed how lovingly the girl now treated Snoopy. What such an excursion can do, said Mrs. Martin, amazed, and went into the house to prepare lunch. Bibi and Tina had meanwhile taken Sabrina and Amadeus to the stable and unsaddled them. Alex and Roger unhitched Max and Moritz from the wagon, and the other children groomed their ponies. A mouth-watering smell wafted over to the children from the house kitchen. Lunch was about to be served, and Bibi and Tina remembered that they had promised their mother to help set the table. Alex also joined them. He had just come out of the tack room where he'd stowed Max and Moritz's harness. I'm so hungry, he proclaimed. Together, the children entered the hallway of the house and were about to turn right into the kitchen when they suddenly heard Mrs. Martin's voice from the office. The door was open. She seemed to be on quite a serious phone call. What? Mrs. Martin exclaimed in horror. Surely that can't be. I impossible. At once, the children were alarmed. They moved closer to the open door. They saw that Mrs. Martin was completely pale. She was silent for a while and just nodded. Then finally, she said with a defeated voice, Yes, I understand. We'll sit down together and I will explain the matter to them. She said goodbye and hung up. Her hands were shaking. Mom, cried Tina, alarmed. What's the matter? Mrs. Martin had not even noticed the children. Tina's question startled her. Tina knew that something really bad must have happened if her mother lost her temper like that. That was Falco, said Suzanne Martin in a husky voice. It's about Martin's farm. With a grave look, Tina's mother took in the faces of each child. So what about the farm? asked Tina impatiently. Mrs. Martin had to clear her throat before she could answer. <clears throat> we have to leave. Martin's farm no longer belongs to the von Falkenstein family. Testing of the Seal Bibi, Tina, and Alex were stunned and barraged Mrs. Martin with questions, but she had to sit down first. When she had regained her composure, Mrs. Martin suggested getting Roger right away. Tina hurried out and came back a little later with her brother. He, too, was completely beside himself, as Tina had already told him on the way what Mother had said. Is this true? he shouted angrily. We have to clear out of Martin's farm? There's no way! It can't be! I'm afraid so, sighed Mrs. Martin. Tell me, Mom, Tina pleaded. What exactly did the Count say? Mrs. Martin took a deep breath and began telling about the offer which Mr. Overland had made Count Falco von Falkenstein the day before yesterday for Martin's farm, and which the Count had decidedly declined. It had been mentioned that the ancestors of the Overland family and the von Falkenstein family had already been dealing with each other centuries ago. The contractor had searched his family archives and found an ancient document. At this point, Mrs. Martin came to a halt. What was written in this document was simply outrageous. Come on, Mommy, pushed Tina. What does the document say? The document was signed by Francis von Falkenstein, the grandson of the founder of the castle, Leo von Falkenstein, Mrs. Martin continued. In it, he transfers land to his then house and farm manager, a certain Oswald Overland, exactly the land on which Martin Farm stands today. At these words came gasps, followed by an astonished silence. This simply cannot be, Bibi shouted indignantly. Hang on a minute, Roger also piped up. There's something fishy about this. First, this Mr. Overland wants to buy Martin's farm, and then two days later he finds out that the farm belongs to him? That's no coincidence. Right, Tina agreed with him. This Overland has to prove the document is real. But the Count already had the idea to have the document checked by an expert. The historian, Professor Cuckoo, Mrs. Martin began again. Mr. Overland had no objections at all to this. To the contrary, he had wanted to have the matter settled as quickly as possible. He plans on going to the castle with the document this evening at six o'clock. Then we'll be there too, cried Bibi. And after checking the document, Mr. Overland will get the shock of his life, 
Alex said. I'm sure it's just a big fake. Together, they decided that Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Mrs. Martin would ride to the castle that evening, while Roger would take care of the camp guests. But first it was time to eat. Bibi, Tina, and Alex didn't bring up the matter at all during lunch, and in the afternoon they remained composed and kept their worries to themselves. Bibi and Tina gave riding lessons to the younger camp children, and Alex and Roger took a cross-country ride together with the older kids. When everyone had returned to the farm, Bibi, Tina, and Alex met with their horses in front of the stables, where Mrs. Martin had already saddled her black and white mare, Topsy, and set off for the castle. Roger stood at the gate and watched them go with a worried expression. What kind of message would they return with? It was six o'clock sharp when they arrived at the castle. Mr. Overland's big car was already parked in the yard. Harry, the Count's stableman, had come to meet them and take the horses away to feed them. By now, he had heard from Butler Ecclebert what the contractor's visit was all about. Harry always seemed to have a grumpy look on his face, but now he seemed to have sympathy for Mrs. Martin and the children. The gentlemen are still looking for the professor, he told them. They couldn't find him in the castle. He probably lost something again, Bibi whispered to Tina, who had to laugh despite her nervousness. If you care to look as well, said Harry, the others are in the castle garden. He led the horses over to the stables, while Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Mrs. Martin walked around the side of the castle. Further ahead, they could see the stocky figure of the contractor. He looked behind the bushes by the castle wall, while Count Falkel von Falkenstein took a quick look behind some trees. The children explained to one bewildered Mrs. Martin that Albertus Cuckoo was a rather messed-up professor who was always misplacing something. If only he'd lose that lousy document, said Mrs. Martin grimly. Then we'd be done with this mess. Bibi noticed that the Count and Mr. Overland were obviously looking at the wrong end of the garden, as she had just discovered the professor. His backside was sticking out of a flower bed just below the library on the outer wall of the castle. Professor, she called to him, and went over to the flower bed with Tina, Alex, and Mrs. Martin. Have you forgotten the appointment? You're supposed to be in the castle. Professor Cuckoo bolted up in shock. He wasn't looking for his glasses, as the children quickly realized. One was on his nose, and the other was in his hand. Appointment? Oh, uh, my goodness, indeed, he uttered, jumping up hastily brushing the potting soil from his pants. What were you looking for? Alex asked. Well, uh, my seal, I mean, my cookie, he stammered. I thought maybe I accidentally threw it out the window yesterday. They no longer had time to inquire about the cookie, because Mr. Overland's voice suddenly came booming over them. Albertus, there you are. Together with the Count, he hurried over to them on his stubby legs. Ah, if it isn't Mrs. Martin and the children, cried the contractor. Well, have you packed yet? Mrs. Martin's face darkened at once. Tina had never seen her mother so angry. Mrs. Martin shot Mr. Overland a poisonous look and hissed. I wouldn't be so sure of myself if I were you. But my dear, Mr. Overland smiled hypocritically at Mrs. Martin. I never do anything until I'm absolutely sure of myself. Wait and see, replied Mrs. Martin. The professor has not yet delivered his verdict. Which brings us to the subject at hand, the Count joined in. That's right, obliged the contractor. Now that we've found our expert, let's go right in and post haste, if you please. Time is money, he exclaimed, hurriedly making his way towards the castle entrance. Have courage, Suzanne whispered the Count to Mrs. Martin. This will all be cleared up in a moment. Mrs. Martin just nodded. She was just as queasy as the three children. Count Falco von Falkenstein was also greatly upset by the matter. Not only his family's estate was at stake, but the welfare of his dear childhood friend, Suzanne Martin, and her children, Roger and Tina. Butler Ecclebert was already waiting for them at the entrance and led them through the hall into the salon. There they all sat down at the table, Without further ado, Mr. Overland took a parchment from his briefcase and spread it out on the table in front of Professor Cuckoo. Now, say quickly, Albertus, that this is the real document, he urged. Then the matter will be settled. Objection, protested the Count. Our expert will take all the time he needs for a thorough review. Not only Mrs. Martin and the children agreed with him, but Professor Cuckoo admonished Mr. Overland noting that a scientific and completely neutral investigation needed careful deliberation. What matters most is the seal, he explained, and that is what I will now thoroughly examine. 
He bent over the document and eyed it closely. Bibi, Tina, and Alex hardly dared to breathe with excitement. The minutes were agonizing, passing much too slowly. Again and again, the professor muttered, Ah, and aha. He paid particular attention to the inscription that ran around the seal and contained the word Franciscus. Finally, he said, Well, if you ask me... We are asking you, Albertus, Mr. Overland reminded him. Professor Cuckoo stood up and looked around, but realized he couldn't recognize anyone with his nearsighted glasses. He switched them laboriously with his other pair and announced, This cookie here looks just like the one I had yesterday. Nobody said anything. Everyone was staring at the professor. Mr. Overland was the first one to shake up the awkward moment. Albertus, this isn't about pastries. It's about a seal. I just said that, the professor replied. This seal looks exactly like the one the Count showed me yesterday. And is it real or not? asked Mr. Overland. There's no doubt about it, Professor Cuckoo replied. The seal is genuine. Mrs. Martin collapsed. Bibi, Tina, and Alex sat motionless, dumbstruck. They realized what the professor's words meant, and Mr. Overland, in his triumph, did not hesitate to offer a rude reminder. So, Mrs. Martin, I'll give you three days. By then, you will have left the farm. I'll pick up my daughter tomorrow at noon. Elated, he stood up and rubbed his hands. He was already thinking about what he had to do in the next few days. First, I'll give the architect the green light, then the site manager, and in three days, I'll have the wrecking ball machines get to work. Mr. Underland, the Count bellowed with disgust. One would expect a little more sensitivity. The contractor who was several days ahead in his thoughts, looked at the Count in surprise. Only now did he seem to have understood what he had just heard. My name is Overland, and I've never gotten anywhere with sensitivity, he said. And with that, the contractor crossed the room on his short legs and slammed the door shut with a bang as he left. Over and out. Downhearted and still in disbelief, Bibi, Tina, and Mrs. Martin rode back to Martin's farm. The Count had suggested that Mrs. Martin keep her horses at the castle for the time being. There were still stalls available, and in the surrounding paddocks, enough space for all of them anyway. The mill farmer had agreed on the telephone that the dairy cows and chickens could be kept at his place. As they figured, he charged them a steep fee for this, but Count Falkenstein had offered to help pay a portion. They had also called Roger from the castle. He had listened in silence while his mother told him the story of the seal. Mrs. Martin had asked him to inform the children's parents that they were to pick them up first thing tomorrow after breakfast. Roger, with a choked-up voice, had promised to do so. My goodness, Mrs. Martin suddenly remembered. I've forgotten our goat, Sir Billy. And where will we put our ducks? The rabbits? And the little kittens? Tina began sobbing. Stop it, Mommy. I can't hear it. Even Bibi could no longer hold back the tears. It was bad enough for her that her summer paradise was now over. But Tina had grown up on Martin's farm. She had spent her whole life there, and now suddenly all that was gone. It's no use, Tina, sighed Mrs. Martin. These things have to be done, and we only have three days. I know, sniffed Tina, but this is all so terrible. Once again, she looked back at Falkenstein Castle. It towered high above the treetops of the surrounding forest. The sun was already approaching the horizon, and the towers and battlements glowed red in the evening light. Only three more days, Tina thought. Then I won't be able to ride to Martin's farm from here ever again. The children were already in bed when the three riders arrived at Martin's farm. Roger was waiting for them outside the stables. Speechless, he squeezed his mother tightly. Shall I help you with the saddle? He then asked his sister. Tina shook her head. No thanks, Roger, she said, and quietly added, I would like to do that all by myself. Bibi and Tina lovingly brushed and groomed Sabrina and Amadeus and took much more time for this than usual. The horses sensed that something was wrong. Again and again they nudged Bibi and Tina with their soft muzzle, as if they were trying to comfort them. At least the two girls were allowed to keep their favorite horses, even if they would no longer be at Martin's farm. 
how often and when they would find time to ride them in the future was written in the stars. The Count had promised that the Martin family would be allowed to stay in the guest rooms of Falkenstein Castle for as long as necessary. But this was only a temporary solution. Tina's mother had already mentioned looking for an apartment in Falkenstein or Redwell. Mrs. Martin returned Topsy to her stall and came back from the stable. She looked tired and depleted. Mom? asked Tina. Bibi and I would like to spend the night in the barn one last time. Would that be all right? Mrs. Martin nodded. She knew that the hayloft was Bibi and Tina's favorite place and could well understand that the two wanted to say goodbye. But try to go to sleep quickly, she said. The next few days will be quite tiring. She went back to the house, and Bibi and Tina led Sabrina and Amadeus to the stable. Before they closed the stall doors, they squeezed and patted their two darlings once more. Good night, my sweet, whispered Tina in Amadeus's ear. Bibi felt a lump in her throat. Again, the tears welled up and she couldn't say a word. Tina took her friend in her arms. Come, Bibi, we have to go to sleep now. They took their sleeping bags from their room, brushed their teeth and went back over to the barn. The girls climbed the steps of the hayloft ladder and set up a cozy place in the corner. Neither of them spoke a word, as they were mulling over the many adventures they had had on Martin's farm the plans they had made together in their hiding place, and the many secrets they had shared there. The two friends slipped into their sleeping bags and cuddled up close to one another. They didn't have to say anything. Each of them knew without words what the other was thinking. Bibi puts one and one together. The next morning, Bibi and Tina woke up very early. Hubert's powerful cock a doodle doo resounded across the courtyard. They packed their sleeping bags and went over to the house. Mrs. Martin was also awake. From the kitchen, the girls heard the rattling of pans and caught the heavenly scent of hot cocoa drifting by their noses. They took a quick shower and slipped into their riding clothes. Their first task of the day was to take Nora and Topsy to Falkenstein Castle. One by one, they would bring the other horses over there as well. Before they set off on their first ride, they drank a cup of cocoa with Mrs. Martin in the kitchen and ate a breakfast bun with jam. The two of them were quietly relieved that they didn't have to take on the unpleasant task that Tina's mother was facing. In a moment, she would explain to the summer camp children that they were going to be picked up by their parents after breakfast. There would certainly be a lot of excitement, likely followed by tears. Above all, the girls did not want to meet Fiona's father again. The thought alone of Mr. Overland immediately made them sick with anger. I should have cast a spell on him right from the start. Into an earthworm, Bibi muttered. Or a cookie yesterday. Professor Cuckoo could have thrown him out the window. They heard the first children waking up in the back of the guest wing. In one of the rooms, a pillow fight was well underway. Bibi, Tina, and Mrs. Martin could hear the children's bright laughter make its way to the kitchen. You'd better get going, Tina's mother suggested. I'll take care of the little rascals. The girls quickly finished their cocoa and went across the yard to the stable. After they had cleaned and saddled Sabrina and Amadeus, they put a halter on Nora and Topsy and hooked on a lead rope. They left the farm by the back entrance, riding past the orchard. Tina saw that there were already little apples hanging from the trees, some of which were turning blush red. Wistfully, she thought about how she would miss the apple harvest this year, too. Alex waved to them from the gate, and the girls saw that Harry was standing by in the yard to take care of Nora and Topsy. They also discovered someone else, Professor Cuckoo kneeling in the tall grass outside the castle wall, looking for something. He only noticed the girls when Bibi spoke to him. Hello, Professor. Have you lost something again? The historian was startled. Y yes, indeed. Still my seal, he stammered shyly, then immediately corrected himself. I mean, uh, my shoes. Uh, sheep. <laughs> Nonsense. My shoes. Bibi and Tina looked down at his feet, which were in a pair of worn-out loafers. You have your shoes on, Tina remarked. You've got that right, the professor replied. I'm not looking for my shoes, but for my boots, because they're much more practical in the country. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Bibi and Tina didn't even ask why he was looking for his boots outside the castle wall, of all places. They had become used to the fact that the professor lost things in the most impossible places, and so they rode on through the castle gate and then dismounted. Hello, you two, Alex greeted the girls and gave Tina a kiss on the cheek. Harry, the stable hand, tied Sabrina and Amadeus in front of the stable and led Nora and Topsy in. Bibi and Tina were surprised to see that Alex had saddled Maharaja. 
I thought I'd better help you bring some of your horses over, he told the girls. The air is pretty heavy around here. He told them that his father, Count Falco, was terribly tense. He was worried about the Martin family and fretted over the lands he had lost in one fell swoop. In addition, a reporter from the magazine, Castle and Nobleman, had called. He wanted to show up a few days earlier, and the Count was getting nervous. Under no circumstances should the story about Overland get into the press. In addition, Count Falco had not yet made any progress in researching his family's history. And unfortunately, the professor, who was constantly publishing something, had not been of much help either. The girls experienced for themselves how nervous and irritable the Count was. He stormed off with a resounding, Echobert, down the steps of the castle to his butler, who was on his way to the cellar entrance. Echobert was frightened, but he pulled himself together in a dignified butler's way. May I have the pleasure of addressing the Count, he asked. Falco von Falkenstein had to gasp for breath a few times before he could continue talking. He waved his index finger in Egobert's nose and shouted indignantly, You have ventilated again! I, I don't quite understand, sir, replied the butler. The castle must be adequately ventilated, otherwise... But not in the library, Count Falco interrupted especially not when there are important papers lying on the desk that can fly all over the place, like what just happened. Besides, for this besides, the Count had to take another deep breath. Besides, there's never any peace in this house when there should be. These are troubled times, if I may say so, the butler defended himself cautiously. But now Count Falco was really on a roll. No, you may not make that remark. The other day, for example, don't deny it, you received a visitor during my nap without asking my permission. The butler's face flushed red up to his ears. Oh, is that what you heard? Well, I didn't let that man in. He was let in, or rather he let himself in. That brazen building contractor has... Save your excuses, Count Fockel snapped at him. If I can't rely on you, you'll soon have to look for another position. This seemed rather harsh and unfair. Before Ecclebert could say anything to his defense, the Count simply left him and hurried back to the castle. Oh dear, Alex, said Tina. Your father's nerves are really shot to pieces. Bibi said nothing. Something about Ecclebert's words had puzzled her, but she couldn't quite place it at first. My witch's nose is tingling, she murmured. Ecclebert said something crucial for all of us. What's it matter? asked Alex. Some papers got mixed up in the library and my father got mad. No, no, I'm not talking about the papers, Bibi kept thinking. This business regarding a visit, there was something strange about it. Because the visitor let himself in, considered Tina. That's it, cried Bibi. She ran like lightning after the butler, who had already descended the steps to the cellar entrance. Stop, Ecclebert, wait. What can I do for you? The butler asked in surprise. That visit you were just talking about, the contractor, exclaimed Bibi excitedly. It wasn't Jake Overland by any chance, was it? Yes, yes, this impertinent man just pushed me aside and went straight to Professor Cuckoo in the library, complained Ecclebert. Bibi looked at her friends with a triumphant sparkle in her eyes. So that's it. You only have to put two and two together. Now I understand what happened here. Bibi, however, was the only one who did so. Her friends looked at her perplexed. You've lost me completely, Alex confessed. Twice now we have seen Professor Cuckoo looking for something explained Bibi. Yesterday he claimed he was looking for a cookie. Now it's his boots he's missing. Alex still did not understand. What do cookies and boots have to do with Mr. Overland? It's not about cookies and boots, Bibi said impatiently. That was just him talking his way out of it. First he said something else, then corrected himself. Tina suddenly lit up. The seal, she cried. He said he was looking for a seal. And yesterday, Bibi continued, after examining the document, he said, This seal looks exactly like the one the Count showed me. Don't you get it? First, the Count showed him the seal of Francis von Falkenstein. Then, Mr. Overland came, and afterwards, Professor Cuckoo was desperately looking for a seal. Wait, Bibi, once again, very slowly, Alex asked. There's no time for that now, urged Bibi. Tell your father quickly. We must go to Martin's farm immediately, and we'll take Professor Cuckoo, too. Bibi ran off with Tina towards the castle gate to fetch the professor. I should talk to my father? 
when he's in such a horrible mood? Alex shouted helplessly after them. Yes, Alex, B.B. hollered back. You must. She thought of Mr. Overland, who would soon arrive at Martin's farm to pick up his daughter. They had to catch him there. If B.B.'s thoughts were right, this could save the entire farm. If they were right. But they are, thought B.B. They certainly are. Where's Fiona? As B.B. and Tina had expected, there was a great deal of excitement among the children after they had learned from Mrs. Martin that they would be leaving the farm that day. Everyone had burst into wild chatter. Can you believe it? Leaving Martin's farm? Now? So suddenly? But why? asked Fiona. Oh, it's so beautiful here. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave, she whimpered. Fiona felt terribly lost. She had finally grown to love Martin's farm and had found such great new friends, Linus and Lena, and above all, her beloved pony, Snoopy. A little while later, she overheard Mrs. Martin say to Roger, when you have finished working in the cow barn, please put the bridles and saddles together. As soon as the horses and ponies are at Falkenstein Castle, we'll bring them all with the van. Did that mean that it wasn't just the summer camp kids who had to leave? Also, the ponies would leave Martin's farm? No, that could not happen. She and Snoopy would not be separated. They would never split up. And she already had cooked up an idea what to do. In the meantime, all the camp children had gone to their rooms to pack. That is... Almost all of them. Fiona had only pretended to go to her room. She stopped, turned around, and walked quietly through the hall back towards the front door. She peered out carefully into the yard. No one was in sight. Fiona hurried to the stable, and with all her strength, heaved the handle just enough for the heavy wooden door to open. Fiona slipped through and ran to Snoopy's stall. The pony snorted and neighed happily when he saw Fiona. She wrapped her arms around Snoopy and caressed him with all her heart. Yes, my sweet, you're also happy, she whispered into his ear. You know, the summer camp children have to go now, and the ponies will be taken to Falkenstein Castle, but I don't want that. We have to stay together. The pony looked at her with his big black eyes, as if he could actually understand what she was explaining to him. Don't worry, Fiona added, as if to calm Snoopy. I don't want to run away again. I just want to hide out in the yard with you, and I already know where. In response... The pony snorted once and let Fiona lead him out of the stall. In the saddle corner of the stable, she took a halter from the hook and put it around the pony. In front of the gate, she stopped and hesitated. How was she going to get the heavy wooden door open on her own, so that the pony would fit through? But Snoopy had made up his own mind and stuck his head into the door opening, then squeezed himself outside. Fiona followed and looked around the yard. It's right over there, she whispered to the pony. Come on! Real quick, so nobody sees us, okay? Snoopy snorted briefly and ran out into the yard alongside Fiona. At that moment, a car with squealing tires slammed on the brakes right in front of the house entrance. Someone was leaning on the horn impatiently. That can only be Mr. Overland, murmured Mrs. Martin. When she opened the front door, she saw that she had been right in her assumption. The contractor's shiny blue car was parked directly in front of the entrance. Ah, Mrs. Martin! How are you? shouted Mr. Overland through the open car window. I hope my little princess is already packed, because I want to leave right away. Time is money, as I always say. One day you too will understand that money isn't everything, replied Mrs. Martin, unsure where she got the courage for this response at that particular moment. If I were you, I would at least give Fiona enough time to say goodbye in peace. This put Mr. Overland a little off his game. Say goodbye, he asked taken aback. What for? She'll be glad to get out of here. Just take a little bit of time for your daughter, replied Mrs. Martin. Then you will see that Fiona has spent the past few days feeling quite comfortable here. For a moment, Mr. Overland's expression slipped away from him. He wasn't used to being contradicted, and he didn't like what he had just heard. His mouth opened and closed silently, but he again quickly found his retort. No, 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 my dear. You seem to have lost all sense of reality, he hissed. I don't see how my daughter could feel all comfortable here at such a pathetic riding school. She's accustomed to much better. Mrs. Martin began another peppery reply, but Mr. Overland cut her off with a decisive gesture. Enough of this nonsense. Go and fetch my daughter so we can leave. Nobody is leaving. Mrs. Martin looked up in surprise. It was Bibi. She came galloping on Sabrina through the courtyard gate, closely followed by Tina, 
Alex, and Count Falco von Falkenstein on Cleopatra, his noble Arabian thoroughbred. A length behind them followed another rider, who made for a somewhat sorry sight on the horse. It was Professor Cuckoo on Nora. He held himself in the saddle with great difficulty, clutching the mane and reins in one hand and waving wildly around in the air with the other. Hoo-hoo! Nice and slow! He cried, but his horse didn't seem the least bit intent on hearing him. When Nora finally stopped in front of the house, the professor breathed a sigh of relief and lowered himself out of the saddle. Mr. Overland was immediately on edge. The fact that not only Count von Falkenstein, but also Professor Cuckoo had appeared at Martin's farm in such a hurry seemed to worry him visibly. And may I know what this procession is all about? He barked at the five riders. Why, certainly, said Bibi. It's about the document of Francis von Falkenstein. I suppose it's still in the briefcase lying there in the seat next to you? Mr. Overland hastily snatched the case. What's this all about? Professor Cuckoo confirmed beyond a doubt that the document's genuine. No, he did not, Tina chided. He confirmed that the seal is authentic, and indeed it is. Because it is the seal of Francis von Falkenstein that Count Falco von Falkenstein had entrusted to me for examination, the professor intervened indignantly. You stole it from me, Jake. That was not nice of you. That, that, gasped Mr. Overland. You'll have to prove it to me first. Nothing could be easier, Bibi replied. Let's see the document. The contractor was visibly cornered. That's absolutely out of the question. Professor Cuckoo eyed him sternly over the edge of his glasses. Open the bag, Jake. This is serious. This time it's not just about marbles you steal from your friends. Fine, growled Mr. Overland. Reluctantly, he removed the document from his pocket. Bibi stuck out her hands and cast a spell. Eeny meeny blackbird song, to whom does the seal truly belong? Whiz, whiz. With a swooshing sound, little magic stars sparkled from Bibi's fingers through the car window to the document. They circled around the seal which tore itself from the paper with a whoosh and flew in a high arc into the hand of Count von Falkenstein. That settles it, cried Alex. The seal belongs to my father. Mr. Overland has stolen the seal and stuck it onto a false document. The contractor didn't pay him any attention, but Bibi's spell had rattled him. What was that? He cried. Magic? There's no such thing. That's just some silly trick. No, it's not, Tina said coldly. Bibi is a witch and she can actually perform magic. She turned to her friend. Bibi, didn't you want to turn Mr. Overland into an earthworm? Oh, yes, said Bibi enthusiastically and raised her hands. When Mr. Overland saw the determined expression on her face, he finally came to his senses. Okay, it's true, he confessed. I screwed up. The document is a fake. Martin's farm and the surrounding land belong to Count Falco von Falkenstein and his family. When I heard that there was a certificate confirming this land was actually transferred to my family, I wanted to make it happen. After all, I have wonderful plans for Martin's farm. It could be a fantastic country club. But this is already a dream paradise, said Bibi indignantly. Ask your daughter. She'll confirm it. Jake Overland, who had disappeared deeper and deeper into the seat of his car, suddenly straightened up. My daughter, he murmured. Where is Fiona, anyway? Fiona, he cried out loud and got out of his car. Where are you? Everyone looked around for her, but couldn't find her anywhere. Didn't she pack her bags with you? Mrs. Martin asked the other children, who, in the meantime, had all gathered at the front door. Lena, who was in a room with Fiona, shook her head. I haven't seen her for a while. Bibi, Tina, and Alex thought again about that night at camp when Fiona had ridden away on Snoopy. Had she tried that again? Maybe we'd better check if Snoopy is still in his stall, Tina whispered to her friends. The three of them began running to the stable, but stopped suddenly at the sound of neighing coming from the barn. That's Snoopy, cried Alex in surprise. What is he doing in the barn? I think that's where Fiona is hiding with them, Tina suspected. Fiona is hiding? cried Mr. Overland, who had followed them confused. Hiding from whom? And why? You'd better ask your daughter that yourself, said Mrs. Martin. Come on. True Friends Mrs. Martin headed briskly toward the barn, followed by Bibi, Tina, Alex, and Jake Overland. When she opened the barn door, the contractor called out, Fiona, 
Where are you? Two heads appeared behind the wagon, the gray head of the pony, Snoopy, and the dark curly head of Fiona Overland. Please, Daddy, begged Fiona as she started to cry. Snoopy can't leave here, and I want to stay too with my pony and my friends. You never have time for me anyway, and this is the most beautiful place in the world. You always want to put me in some stupid expensive country club. I don't like it. I want to stay here. But Fiona, princess, if I'd only known, you wanted to leave. You didn't even like it here. Mr. Overland was quite confused. What happened that made you change your mind? That was the moment when Mrs. Martin decided to leave the two of them alone. She closed the barn door carefully. I think, she said thoughtfully, father and daughter have a lot to talk about. And maybe you'll tell me what really happened on your trip. There must be a reason why Fiona changed her mind. She turned to her daughter. Bibi and Tina looked at each other, and then they told Mrs. Martin what had happened, about the fight with Fiona, how she had run away, and that Snoopy had saved her. When Mr. Overland finally stepped out of the barn, he had his arm around his daughter. He walked straight up to Mrs. Martin and the Count, shook her hand, and said apologetically, I'm sorry. So truly, truly sorry. I shouldn't have done what I did. I had no right, neither the right to forge the document, nor the right to destroy your home. Only now do I realize what a phenomenal place Martin's Farm really is even without a luxury hotel, golf course, and all the frills. After my daughter told me all about it, I realized that it doesn't always matter if something is expensive and high class. What's important are friends. Friends who help you when you're in need. Does that mean we can stay on the farm? Asked Mrs. Martin. But of course, the Count proclaimed. Mr. Under... No, Overland has admitted that the document is not genuine. In fact, this is a case of fraud. But in light of the fact that nothing really terrible has happened yet, I think we should just agree to let the matter rest. And because I'm really sorry about all this, cried Mr. Overland, relieved, I suggest we celebrate with a big party, with all new and old friends, and I'm paying for the whole thing. He looked at his old friend Albertus Cuckoo firmly. To friendship, cried the professor. To Martin's farm cried the Count, and its wonderful inhabitants. May it remain so for generations to come. A fantastic party was held that evening at Martin's farm with all of the summer camp children. The Count of Falkenstein and his son, Professor Cuckoo and his old friend Jake Overland, Mrs. Martin, Roger, Tina and Bibi, and of course Fiona, who sat together with her friends Lena and Linus around a big campfire. Bibi, Tina, and Alex were sitting together on a tree trunk a bit further from the others when Bibi gave Tina a light nudge. Look, she cried, pointing up to the night sky where a shooting star was twinkling. Come on, let's make a wish. Tina closed her eyes. What would she wish for? She could think of nothing else but what she had wished for a few days ago at the mill pond. She smiled. Tina had the sure feeling that her wish from the other day had already been fulfilled. She had the best friends in the world and the best family one could ever imagine. No, she didn't have to make any more wishes. With all of the wonderful people around her, it would always remain so beautiful here at her beloved Martin's farm. <laughs>